There are all types of wine, from sparkling to still, and of course, the one that we all treasure the most, fortified wine. And out of the fortified wine category, port is a personal favorite of mine. Today's guest is considered to be the authority with his decade year old work that he has punctuated his personality, his time and efforts. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you a man of letters who has moved from the world of mathematics into the world of port. And allow me to introduce you, Mr. Julian D.A. Weissman. And that's to make sure we don't confuse ourselves with another Julian Weissman, who is involved in an entirely different field and expertise, that of port. Welcome to the show, Julian. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Excellent. The only thing wrong is it's five in the afternoon, which is a little bit early to have brought with me refreshments. Ah. If you could arrange it at nine in the evening, then maybe I could have a little array of, of but nonetheless, let's move forward. Well, Julian, from the world and learned halls of Euclid, Pythagoras, and Fibonacci, you transition to the intense richness, beauty, and history of the Doro and Port. Share with us your unique personal story up to the point of transition to Port, Julian. Well, I'm going to dispute this verb transition. That suggests leaving something behind. It suggests ceasing to be something as well as being something else. I discovered I was a mathematician or an aspirant mathematician age 10, and I discovered Port age 19. But I've never left either behind since then. So you're running a dual purpose, uh, Julian, now, are you? Well, there's a dual purpose and there's minor matters. Your wife, I have to be happy and children and cats, you know, and a house refurbishment, which is why it's such a mess behind me. Um, there are multiple strands to a life, but port has been an important part of mine since I was 19. I, just, I suddenly discovered it. It's not quite discovering something new that no one else had discovered before, they'd be making it for two centuries. But I discovered it and realized, well, this is what a wine is all about. Uh, and in some sense it is, you could argue that Parker wines are trying to be a parody of port, or maybe a parody of Parker wine is port, but you don't need to muck around with a parody. You can go for the proper, pure original without trying to be something it's not. Port is a big, fruit rich, heavy, full bodied, chunky wine. It's the sort of wine that says, hold my coat before picking a fight with you. It's not delicate, shy, retiring fool in the corner. Right. And I like my wines, I like my drink, full and big and huge. It's, it's, I recognize other people have other tastes and that's fine. But for those who like their, if you like a big claret with your steak, try having a port. If you like having Barolo, I mean, how can one not like having Barolo? Um, with lamb, hmm, could a crusted port or a youngish vintage port go here? And the answer is yes. And it will do, it, do the job just as well and for less money. Okay. You can buy a great. So, so you find the, the the sweetness of the port and uh, the savory of, of of the big chunky steak, as you described it, would go well. I'm asking you to test it. I'm not asking you to believe me, because people will go, "Oh, that's a bit strange." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Invest one bottle of port and one steak in a trial. Um, so there's nothing like testing things. I've tested decanting techniques. I test things. It's a good way to learn about the world. Oh, well, I'm a carrot person. Steak person. No, give it a go. All right, we'll, a, give, a we'll give it a go, port, we'll give it a whirl. A crusted it's port from a supermarket. A crusted is a junior vintage port, often not very junior, quite young, 15, 20 quid. I'm not, I'm not busting a bank here. <laughs> try it. Try your, try your favorite big savory dish, red meat, with port, and you'll come away going, actually, hmm, 
I've been saving two glasses of port for the end of the meal, and that's been a strategic error. So, well, audience, that's something that you should try, uh, yeah. as, as Julian has suggested there. And so if, your love if, affair with port began at the age of 19. Went to university, matriculation dinner, off to read maths. Never had port before. I mean, I'd heard of it, but I'd never had it. My father never drank it. He was carrot, burgundy, Italians. Mm -hmm. Never had port before. Later, I didn't know what it was at the time. I wasn't wise enough to, to take a careful note of what it is I was drinking. But from what was in those cellars, I, I believe it was a tale of 1970. And I was drinking it in 1987, 17 years after the harvest. So it feels now to me like a very young port. In fact, tonight I'm going to be drinking some Graham 1970. You might be able to see the bottle behind me. I'm taking it to a tasting with friends. So from the same year, but now it's 52. And it, uh, I was tasting it then too young, and now I'm having it fully mature. It does not need more time. And it's been a splendid vintage the whole of that time. And it, for somebody who's, even then I worked out in red wines, my, the favourite of my father's red wine was Barolo. Really? It's, it's got all these size, size adjectives again. Here I am tasting port, and I go, this is the wine for me. So later that term, I went and spoke to the Sullivan. Cambridge College had a Sullivan in those days. Times, times have become a bit more penurious since. Um, I went and spoke to the Sullivan, found out what was in the cellar, found out what the fellows were allowed to buy, and wrote a, wrote a nice letter to the wine fellow. So I'd like to learn more about port. Please yeah. could I buy from the sellers? They're on the fellows list, I wasn't allowed them. And please, would you, would you be willing to come along and, and talk, talk me and my friends through a port tasting? A good bit of brown nosing. You know. nothing, nothing like flattery to make people be helpful. It was very helpful. He said, I've instructed the Sullivan to let you have one of each of those bottles at the fellow's price. I bought a tailor 55 for 20 pounds a bottle. They were selling port at replacement cost. The college sold port at what it cost them to replace it with a 1985. This is 1987. The 30 years of aging counted for nothing. They had a bottle, a bottle out and a bottle in, and it's Cambridge College. They can wait forever. Right. So it worked. I had a tasting with friends of 55, a 63, a 66, and some 70s. It was not a shabby first tasting. It's a wonderful wine. And I've later learned it's a wonderful one. It's actually incredibly good value. Spend fifty pound on a bottle of port, you can get a wine as good as a five hundred pound Bordeaux, a thousand pound Burgundy. So, so Julian, your your um, your relationship really began sort of in your um, early twenties. Now, they say every magnificent work has that aha moment. What was the catalyst that catapulted you into the fine world of port, and thereby? shackling you to 10 years of servitude to port. I'm going to have and to explain the conceit of the God, book you know, sort of uh, writing your extraordinarily defining book. Ah, you're holding up your first edition there. This is the first edition. A mere 385,000 words to you, my friends. And what kind of nutter writes that? Right. What's the question? It answers a question, and it's worth actually discussing the question. Pick, your, pick a French wine. They make it every year. Okay. Chateau Mouche on the Rothschild. They've made it every oh. year since the war. If the sun shines, it's great wine. If it rains all year, it's not so great, but they still make it. Every year they make it. Not true of vintage port. They declare, to use the term of art, they declare a vintage only in some years. Each house declares a vintage for itself. Now, there's some correlation. Obviously, if the weather's really great here and it's really great here, then there's a fair chance it's really great over the whole valley and everybody declares a vintage. Sometimes years are a bit of a mix. Some houses have got some microclimates that give them good enough grapes, and some don't, and decisions are made. Others are just terrible. Would you fine. mind holding your book up again, please, um, Julian? And I think it's, um, it's very important for, for potential readers and audience that it is on port vintages, like vintage ports. That's it's only vintage subject. ports. So for those of you who are collectors, this book 
um, may be of interest to you uh, as a reference because you once described this book and I'm also uh, considering your second edition, Julian, to be a history and reference book. Would that be correct? It's very much a history and reference book. Very much that. Um, Edwin Voss, head of Christie's wine department, says he refers to it for every wine auction. He's selling a port, he wants to check. This is, this is it. And I'm going to come back to that uh, aspect in, um, in a few minutes. But right now, I, we're curious, you know, a decade of, of a man's life dedicated to the writing of this book. Did you ever consider quitting during your years of research into port? Well, yeah. let me, I'm going to come to your question. Let me finish describing what the book is about. Yeah, please. Then I, then I can guide you through the research and what happened. So port houses declare a vintage only in some years. Obvious question. It's not a complicated question, my friends. It's an obvious question. Which years and which houses declare? And somebody ought to have made a database. And indeed, there are several books with lists of vintages at the back. All these books have it wrong. Other than that, all these excellent. books have it all wrong. All of them. All of them have it wrong. Omissions, errors of omission, errors of commission, things in that shouldn't be, things not in that should be. Right. Have you had a barrage of comments and criticisms from? Oh, I've had um, lots of comments, and criticism, uh, but not from authors. That, well, most of these authors are deceased, and even those whose relatives are alive have all been. <laughs> it depends what you're trying to do, and this is a book answering one question, whereas they've included a five-page appendix and a book talking about other stuff. So I've, I've got I've got more focus on this. So which years did they declare? It's obviously right to the houses. They'll know. Since the, the port authors don't know, you write the houses and they all send lists, which well, be wrong. Almost all of them had errors. In fact, I think or every single house got it wrong. So what is, go look for actual data. Now I'm really helped because port is largely a British wine. So let's go through the wine committee minutes of every place that had wine committees since 1800. Let's right. Although you say it's British wine, it's actually made in Portugal. It's made in Portugal by firms with names like Coburn, Graham, Dow, Taylor. Yes. Right. It was made by largely British-owned firms for one market. The UK was the largest market until 1994. That is true, yes. Um, and I have looked elsewhere. I've been to libraries in the Netherlands. I've had help with Scandinavia. Uh, and I've, of course, been to Portugal. And the Portuguese firms have been very helpful. Having sent me lists, they've often sent me more data that contradicted their own lists. They've been, they've been, it's been superbly helpful from everybody who's understood, oh, hell, we don't actually know. Let's see what we can find, and let's see what right. he can find, and put it together in a chapter that makes the record. And indeed, if you ask the firms now, what did you declare this year? They will pull Wiseman off the shelf and answer the question. Except that having written the first edition, people sent me more data. I spent 10 years going through dusty archives. I didn't need more data. Oh, they sent me more data. Some of which confirmed previous things and some of which was new. And so there's a second edition, which is about 10% longer. And I'm very pleased that all my errors in the first edition are errors of omission. There are things I didn't know and they're right. not in the book. But errors of commission, I wrote this and it was wrong, almost non-existent. I did include a credit for the picture on the front cover, which then got removed. Um, but that's the but errors of commission about port, none. I was very, very retentive and thorough. I wrote the book with a lot of numbers in brackets. So it's marble throughout the text. Every number in brackets referred to a picture. So I then read through the whole book, checking every purported fact against the photograph of the records that contained that fact. So My quotations highly detailed, highly researched. I wanted to be right. I didn't want to be another source of careless errors. I wanted to be right. And if I say that the Worshipful Company of Salters had a wine committee meeting on this date and wrote this, it means I've checked it two or three times. That's so, what they said. Of course, they might have been wrong. But when there's doubt about things, I'd say, hmm, I don't believe this, but I'm showing you anyway. Right, uh, but many right. times, 
everyone and his brother tasted COVID in 1896. I have no reason to doubt it. Okay. I've never, well, I've never had it myself. Well, so your, your uh, research took you into the uh, sort of dark uh, dungeons and, uh, and uh, record rooms, uh, sift, you know, sifting through piles and piles of paper, I'm sure, shipping records. That must have been quite an amazing experience for you. If spending a day in a dusty archive with no sunlight is an amazing <laughs> experience, then yes. Mm, okay. I'm going to pull out. Well, someone's got to do it. Someone's got to do it. Only one place did I go there, discover they prepared a little room for me. They got all the records I needed on the table and a glass and a bottle of their 10 year tawny and a glass. Ah. That was the Wine Society. I went wow. to the Wine Society in 2009 and they had understood the project and had set me up with lots of stuff to look at and a glass of something to drink. Every other library seems to disapprove of drinking stuff next to really old records. I wonder why. Hmm. Okay, well, <laughs> well, um, Julian, if I move on, in the world of port, as in everything in life, there's a defining moment. In the world of wine, specifically French wine, 1855 was the defining moment for Bordeaux. And that propelled their stature to stellar heights. How about port? Was there a specific year incident that is clearly got, that defining moment? I've got to say 1756, because that was when they became the first demarcated wine region. Yeah. But I think that's the wrong date. It's actually the wrong date. Because mm -hmm. port back then was a claret-like, unfortified wine with a rather poor reputation. And part of it was just the damn transport. Nowadays, you put stuff in a refrigerated truck and it travels through on a refrigerated truck across EU-built motorways to Calais mm -hmm. and arrives in the UK. In 1756, that wasn't how it worked. It These rather ropey red dry red wines would go down the river get blended a bit get put on more hot wooden ships and sent in a long journey over the north atlantic to southampton it didn't work then they discovered fortification and fortification seems to have gone from being rare say 1780 to being standard by 1815 I've had one eighteen fifteen port, and it was it, super fully mature. We politely said it, it really did. It didn't need more time, but it tasted like a wine that had been fortified partway through the fermentation, which is how port is made. Mm -hmm. When it reaches seven-ish percent alcohol, they add the brandy, and that's why there's excess sugar because the yeast are killed before they've eaten all the sugar. And that's why there's excess alcohol because the brandy provides it. Um, and it tasted like a wine fortified midway through the fermentation. And if I'd been told that this was a 1930s port, fully mature. So are you port. saying that in the early days they used uh, brandy? Because the, in modern day, they use a, a neutral spirit, sort of at 72 degrees alcohol by volume. So was it brandy then in the, in the earlier days then, Julian, that they it added? Was, it was brandy. Wine? Brandy is a fortified, is a distilled grape liquor. Mm -hmm. And you could argue the Aquadente is just an extreme version of brandy. It's about 70 odd percent alcohol. Yes. Um, if ever you're offered a taste of it, go small. Absolutely. Top tip, you top will, tip. You, my advice would be don't try it. You will burn your tongue. Or, or, or do it whiskey style of rubbing it on your hands. Yes. And smelling the hats, uh, which is how whiskey people do it. Certainly. So talking about that defining moment, <clears throat> because... Well, I mean, you're dealing with fortification, but as late as 1904, Sandman didn't have enough brandy, he used whiskey. Oh, is that right, eh? Whiskey? Yeah, the Sandman 04 was fortified in whiskey. Um, so the fortification was... It's easy to write modern rules back into history when those weren't the rules. Yeah. You fortified with something. And in rural Portugal, what are you going to get? Probably a grape brandy that's been distilled a few times over a rather rubbishy still with a wood fire at one end of it. it Portugal was not a 
Portugal was not an industrial revolution, heat of modern technology in 1750s. It really wasn't. No. They had a global empire, but that was more an accident of geography than in industrialization. Okay, so getting back to, um, to, to this defining moment, because was it not around the sort of 1980, mid 1980s, around 86, when um, certain rules changed? Yes. It used to be that port had to be shipped over the bar at Gaia. So you had to ship it downriver, you had to have a warehouse in Gaia, and that limited the number of firms there could be. So there were a small number of large firms that bought grapes, usually wine, from a lot of vineyards blended it and shipped it out. Scrapping that allowed vineyards to bottle their own. And you no longer needed to have expensive warehouses in Gaia. You could take, take it to a local bottling line, bottle, have a bottling line come to you mm -hmm. and bottle your bottle, a small, what was a small vintage of a few thousand bottles. Right. As a result, there are now a lot of separate quinta. It used to be there were a small number of, of relatively large famous names. I'll mention Graham, I'll mention Coburn, I'll mention Taylor, as obvious, and Sandman, as obvious examples, already mentioned here. Mm -hmm. They've shrunk in their quantities because the vineyards that used to provide them with grapes, in many cases, no longer do. They sell under their own name. Right. So now, there's, now there's hundreds of names. And so 86 was a big transition year for Port, but wasn't realised as such at the time. It was more a EU type liberalization, get rid of silly rules. So does Post your book cover post 1986, all the other vintages from this plethora of new, uh, you know, Kintos? Nope. I was writing the book. I was including lots of modern stuff. And what is my evidence that Graham declared 1887? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, there's interesting records here, interesting records there, and it's mentioned in this book that was in print 100 years ago. What's my evidence that Graham declared 2003? Well, evidence one is Mr. Google says this, evidence two is Mr. Google says that, and evidence three is Mr. Google says the other thing. Really? If you want to find out about Google, Graham 2003, it's on the web. Okay. And copying the web into a printed form to pay, to pay postage on it isn't useful. It's the old vintage ports where we don't know what's going on. We don't know what happened. We don't know mm -hmm. what's real. And in some cases, the, the firms themselves have had it completely wrong. Uh, so one, of the, one of the big houses had a display in their lodge of bottles with old labels on. The old labels were all modern reproductions of old labels. And most of the bottles were from the years they'd actually made. But at least one, you didn't make that. And you've got a reproduction bottle of it. And you, you're the firm. Right. right. So it's the old stuff which the book deals with. So you, so you would say 1986 was perhaps one of, the, of many defining moments then for Port. What about um, the, the, you know, Port could be bottled um, outside of Portugal and labeled? I think pre-1970, and then... Pre, yeah, um, up to the 70 vintage, it was typically exported in bulk in a shipper's yeah. pipe, 56 dozen, and bottled in the UK. So who bottled it? And indeed, the, the only, the most complete list of bottlers I know is actually the index, or one of these six indexes, to this book, in which every bottler and every bottling of that bottler about which I know is indexed. Because if you're looking at something bottled by Firon Block Firon, oh, sorry, Block Firon Block, oh crap, so all I can see is the bottler. What is it? And having mm -hmm. a list of what they've done is really useful to try and work out what an old bottle is. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, I'm, I'm working with all the data I can gather, and I've gathered a lot of data. Can I say it's all the data? No. I can say that by a long margin, it's the most complete reference book on just the subject. A, just an interesting Therefore, point here. You keep referring to you, I, all the time. Did you work with a team at all? Or were you I just- I started with a co-author. 
And you mentioned, did I ever consider giving up? Yes. Well, one out of two did. Um, he was super helpful the first year. We worked together. Um, largely, his contribution was going to places and photographing records. Lot, I've got lots of his photographs on my computer. The dullness of transcribing all this stuff into databases, databases full of text that could later be assembled into a book, I think it caused him to just lose interest. And eventually he wrote me a nice note, which is in the preface to this book, saying, real life got in the way, I can't be bothered, you get on with it, get this damn thing published. Um, and eventually I did. Well, I think for the those less resilient, it may be a rather soul-destroying piece of work. Now, your book had around 950 pages. You'd need to have several bottles. 650. 650. I, yeah. I have given you more stature, but I'm sure 650 of priceless information. You probably would need several bottles of fine vintage port sort of close by to appreciate your monumental work, Julian. Now, let's look at the hard reality of life. For port collectors, enthusiasts, and the more serious across the globe when it comes to port. Should every collector have a copy of your book and why? Well, it, it divides people into those who are serious about a subject, and those who are not. And it is perfectly possible to drink port with great pleasure by buying a moderate selection of stuff available at a local wine merchant. Indeed, I, I drink plenty available from local wine merchants and indeed supermarkets. We mentioned cross Sport earlier. You don't need a definitive reference book if that's what you're doing. But if you are somebody who is serious about wine, and I'm gonna speak here not a port collector, but think about somebody who is a Rhone collector or a Cali Cab collector, they take it seriously. If you get a chance to own one book that answers a huge proportion of the possible questions about another wine, you should have it. If it's going to be 52 volumes on vintage port, I could understand why a Rome collector might go, Lordy, where am I putting 52 volumes? Um, it's a few shelf inches. And it's and three kilos. That's perfectly fine. So I'm going to play the devil's advocate. I, I'm wanting the, this, this definitive book, and I'm saying, well, I don't trust Google. I, I, I prefer Weissman. So why did he stop? after 1986. I mean, do you think that in a possible third edition you might include post-1986? I don't think so. I'm hoping that there will not be a third edition. Of, so, uh, I mean, <laughs> please, please, no, no, I really don't want to be. Um, but you can go to archive.org and put up old Berry Brothers catalogs, put up old Tanner's catalogs, Right. You don't need to go to a dusty archive to see what they had published in the Yeah, but that would make your life easier. It would make my life easier, but equally the customer's life is fine. If they want to know what was in but it's they can not, find but it. But it's not from JDA Weissman. That's the difference. I don't have to write the definitive truth about everything. I'm allowed to pick a field and say I'm going to get this right, and that's what I'm going to get right. Fair and you, should, you might say, well, if you've done port, what about Madeira, sir? And I rather like Madeira. It's a great wine. But no, I'm not writing a book on Madeira. I've done my bit. Somebody else could pick up Wiseman's port, port vintages. In fact, let me make a different proposal to your readership. Fair enough. The same book should be written about champagne. About old champagne. Somebody should rewrite port vintages as champagne vintages. It's not going to be a mere edit replace. There's going to be a bit of research involved, as in quite a lot. But the structure of the book, the way of thinking about the problem, I think is very applicable. And I could imagine a champagne collector who's about to retire going, right, this is going to be 10 years and it's going to be excellent. And writing the same book about champagne it might be true about some other wines as well i'm not i'm sure it's, now, i think now, it's a broader set to be done here. if i can sort of move on here julian your book at 650 pages remarkable extraordinary it has been described by others as the definitive work 
it is the book to turn to. But let's talk about how to how does it capture and entice the younger generation to read your book, let alone to buy it. And I say this with the greatest respect, in the sense that the flavor of this, the generation now, your millennials onwards, they like to absorb knowledge in small, finite bits. And you're- no, I'm gonna deny, I'm gonna deny all of your question. I totally disagree with the question. Okay. Um, for start, I don't have to write to every audience. I'm allowed to write to port geeks. They are my audience. And, and wine geeks who are immediately adjacent to port geeks. And if you only like delicate whites, I mean, it's not mine. But if you like big reds, you should have this one on your shelf as well. So I'm writing to a fairly narrow audience, and I don't need to write to everybody. Next, what you say about millennials isn't true. Yes, some of their entertainment comes in small bites, which are actually quite amusing, some of these small yes, bites. Yes, of course. But the millennials with whom I deal professionally turn out to have good brains, good thoroughness, and understand that sometimes what you want is all the information in one place in a definitive record that has enough credibility. The author is, an, is, the author is a retarded pedant. He's such a pedant, it's, it's a mental handicap. If it's in here, he's copied it correctly. That is a useful thing, and I think the millennials understand that this is That's isn't right. So just using your own sword, you know, and your cane, I'm going to beat you with it, Julian. If it's in your book, it's definitive and it's credible. I think you should consider post-1986 then. That's a thought. I'm trying to sell a second edition. Let me, I will consider it. My prior is that I will consider it for about 10 minutes and then not consider it again. Uh, that's my expectation. And I'm not gonna do it tonight, but I will consider it at a later stage. I don't think it is necessary. I think the nature of information has changed. So information from the 1850s exists on paper, written with a pen in archives where you need permission to visit. Information from 2003 and 2022 exists in a fundamentally different way. They don't send out paper, they send out emails that point to PDFs. So I, I think the technology, the change in technology allows a change in what is done. Yeah, absolutely. I will, I will give it a thought because you have requested it. But my prior is that I'm not going to be keen. Certainly, Julian. Now, for those that are uninitiated that are listening in today, would you mind spending a minute or two very briefly, you know, describing how vintage port, vintage port, as opposed to, you know, tawny port and the other styles of port, how did that originate? Do your records um, illuminate when they, when vintage port was actually first um, named? As we have port, we have port from a single known vintage. Mm -hmm going back to certainly the 1790s, there are, there are claims of it going back to 1756, 1757, I, claims. It, it was a specific concept, and it is about a mostly bottle-aged wine that spends two years in casks, sometimes three, mm -hmm. and is then bottled. It all comes from one harvest. It's a great product. It, it matures anoxically very slowly. 20 years is a young port, 50 years is starting to, might need a stick and might not. 50 years is proper, proper old port. It is a slow maturing, very big wine. But there are variants of it. We've mentioned crusted a couple of times in this conversation. Imagine yeah. you're the blender at some fine house and you blend up this year and actually you can declare a vintage great news. Some leftovers because you used a lot of this varietal and less of that varietal. It's a little bit spare, but you know, we'll put it away. fine. Next year, blend up what's going on there. But you know what? I've got some bits left over from this year that would blend very nicely with some bits left over from last year. Hmm. You can make a vintage style wine. It comes from more than one harvest. It is not vintage. It legally cannot be called vintage. It is not a vintage port. It is made the same way. It's aged the same way. It will throw a sediment that's called crusted mm -hmm. and is often 
excellent and excellent, excellent value. I admit that I might own a bit of crusted, I might drink a bit of crusted, and I might quite like it. Okay. And I mentioned at the start, you don't need to break the bank on port to taste port with claret. Local supermarkets sell a crusted made by Symington's, bottle 2013, 15, 20 quid. Great value wine. It's a much better wine than plenty. It's, a, it's as good a wine as a 50 pound claret. And being, being fortified, it's strong. You only need to drink two thirds well, as much. It certainly ages, ages far more um, um, reliably than, than certain reds, that's for sure. Let's, let's move on and let's talk about this world that we live in. There's fake handbags, fake wines, fake news, and I'm sure there is fake port. Can, and if so, how can your fine piece of work, Julian, be of assistance to those purchasing a bottle of port that is perhaps 80 plus years or more? Could they use your book? It's As certainly I have in right in selecting what data goes in, assisting tests of genuineness has been a, a, a material criteria for me. I've, I've done that. Port has traditionally been dipped in wax. You cork the bottle, dip it in hot wax to give an extra seal. Mm -hmm. What colour? Every time I know the the, the colour of the seal, the colour of the wax, I've reported mm -hmm. it in the book. I actually have an index of seal colours. So if you're looking at something, you slightly chip the wax on the inside, it's bright red. Ooh, what could bright red be? You can look up an index, which ones I know had bright red wax. The problem is that list won't be complete, will be others, but you might have other information. It was found in a bin with other wines from, or yet a date, but so you can put it together with other clues. But port has a bigger problem with forgery than many, many wines. And a lesser problem. The lesser problem is it's not worth faking. An 80 year old claret is going to be so many thousands of pounds, and an 80 year old port is going to be 150 pounds, 200 pounds. Where do the forges go? But actually, there isn't a lot of fake port. I'm attentive to it, there's more than none, but there's not a lot of it. it is a, it's a fairly small problem. A difficulty yeah. is that, as we discussed earlier, it was often bottled in the UK. Yes. So Graham 1970, I'm having it this evening, was bottled by about 20 different bottlers in different shaped bottles in inconsistent ways with different seal colours and different labels. Right. Okay. Indeed, because port lasts so long, the companies themselves don't keep it labelled. They bottle it, store it in bins unlabeled, and only when they're shipping it out do they give the bottle a rinse down to get rid of the dust and stick a new label on it. And the, if they're releasing it 20 years later, the label from 20 years later must meet the legal standards for labels from 20 years later, with lots of signs telling pregnant women not to drink it. Really? It's to be told. Um, and all the modern rules for wine so, labeling, which are different so, than the so Essentially, what you're labeling. saying is a port could have been in the warehouse for 30 odd years, give it a spray down, get rid of the dust, and then they need to apply the applicable labels under the laws of the time of labeling. And for the jurisdiction to which it's going. Yes, yes. Hmm. Now, so you end up with a greater variety of labelling. There isn't one look for a particular port of a particular year. Because different right. bottlers and different release times all give all cause some variety in this. Oh. Um, I have friends who are particularly expert at spotting these things, and I will always trust their judgment. But I have tried to include all the information useful in the book. However, any forger who is at least semi-competent will, of course, own a copy of the book as well. That's true. You That's having read true. it carefully can draw you level. At least you're not behind. Yes. But you should be at least level. Now, where can one find your fine book, Julian? Right. First edition is sold out, not available in this shop. The second edition is going to the printer, I hope, by the end of this week. It is pre-orders are being taken on the Academy Divan website, and I hope there'll be a link nearby. I encourage you to pre-order so I know how many to print. Well, we'll have but to add one for for the for Apwazi, the Asia Pacific Wine and Spirit Institute. Um, you can only one. 
you'll need you need one for the bedroom you'll need one for the bathroom well yes we have one as our reference and then i've certainly when uh, our students take the the port course with us uh, it would be a very valuable addition uh, towards their studies so certainly and I'm, I'm adopting a policy on signing that if you own a copy of the book and you meet up with me somewhere, I will happily sign it. I'm not charging people 20 quid for signatures for the rest of my life. It's just too much. <laughs> um, it's just not my stuff. So there, it may well be you buy a book, show up to a tasting where I happen to be there five years later, tell me what you want me to write. All right. Happily, very nice. Um, but you've got to buy the book for that. Second edition <laughs> is about 10% more pictures, about 10% more words. And about a, nearly a hundred ports more than the first edition, which itself was ludicrously big. Now, my final question to you, Julian, in this interview, could you share with us a tearfully heartwarming personal experience about port that you've had? Okay. So there was an edition zero. My, my port friends have been waiting for this book for, me, for 10 years, eight years at this time. And I wanted to make something to hold to help me think about it. So at a, a print shop, just print it, glue bind it. It was rubbish, I mean, only, only eight or 10 of them were done. I want one, I want one, I want one. So I took one to Portugal to show the wine people, to show the port people. I wanted them to see that this is, I'm, it's not just empty words coming out of my mouth, and I've been promising this for a long time. There is actually something in the oven. Dirt Nepal is holding it. It's great, he said. It's not about you. And he some wine books are, I went to this wine region, and I had this lunch, and I met this person, and the reader is told by the author's conversations with me. I'm absent from this book. This book is not about me. It's about what's in the records. It's about the wine. The book is really about the poor, but... Julian, really? Have you never had the 1815 Ferrera? I love the comment, like everybody who isn't a total peasant has had this. Hell, even the peasants have had it. Why haven't you had it? <laughs> it, was, it was a look of uh, astonished amusement on his face that I hadn't had it. It was absolutely, no Dirk, I've not. I've had the 1830, it's not a life of great hardship. But I've not had the 15. Dirk disappears. Well, Julian. I my, sorry. Wait, wait, I tell my friends, we better stay. We're not going anywhere. Dirk comes back with a bottle of the 15, goes in the kitchen, just pour, pour, uh, decants it just freehand till the sediment starts appearing. And I get a glass of 1815 Ferrera, which we've mentioned earlier in this conversation. And then Dirk disappears again. He comes out of the kitchen five minutes later. He poured the last inch and a half, the sedimenty bit of the port, into scrambled eggs. He'd made scrambled eggs with 1815 Ferrara. Oh, really? Right. So tell me, what sort of peasant are you? What do you put in your scrambled eggs? I've had 200 year old vintage port in mine. <laughs> and it was bonkers. And it was what fabulous. an extraordinary story. What an extraordinary I loved story. It was fabulous. Well, Thank you very much for sharing uh, that experience uh, with us, Julian. And I'm sure, audience, that if you are wanting to have that definitive reference, historical port uh, book, second edition for Port Vintages by J.D.A. Weissman. Julian, thank you very much for being on the Asia Pacific Wine and Spirit wine buzz show it's been a pleasure having you thank you very much for having me please comment like share or subscribe to our videos